Great song. Do you believe the words? Yeah. You afraid of death anymore? No. Good. I'm glad. Okay. All right. Let's do this. Let's go over to Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. I'd like to speak to you this morning about the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. So everybody's turning there. Wait for you to get there. Verse number 14 says this in Galatians chapter 6. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So this morning we're talking about the crucifixion, our Lord's crucifixion. And when we come to think about the cross, we must pull our feet, <laughs> our shoes off from our feet, like Moses before the burning bush. So we're, we're, we're facing holy ground here. I mean, this is the center of everything that God accomplished as we look at the cross for our redemption, all right, as, as we look at this. Now, there's a couple things that I want you to understand. There's an extraordinary feature about the narrative of the crucifixion in the gospel accounts. Notice when we're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John concerning the crucifixion, all they do is give us the fact he was crucified. They don't tell us how and everything the Lord went through. Now, we're going to go through step by step uh, of the things they did say. But they don't bring up any of the, the horrific things, all right, and actually explain it to you what the Lord was going through as, as he went through it. So keep that in mind. So there, I, I would say this. There's no attempt to pile horror upon horror and agony upon agony. There's no attempt to set out the grim, ghastly details. All right. They don't do that as, as we look here at this. So let's go back to Matthew 27, and we'll begin there, speaking about the crucifixion. All right. Matthew 27. And I'm going to read verse number, first part of verse number 35, I believe. It says this. And when they had crucified him, when they had crucified him, now there's no more terrible death than death by crucifixion. Not at all anywhere. All right? You're not hearing me? No, it fell off. It fell off. Oh, somebody has to say something. <laughs> you just did. I'm sorry, folks. Let me let me hook back up here. All right. All right. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. All right. Here we go. So when we talk about the crucifixion, it, it was horrible. Horrible. And even the Romans themselves regarded it as in a shudder of horror when they talked about it. And what we find is this, that a gentleman named Marcus Tullius Cicero, he was a Roman statesman, orator, lawyer, and philosophy. He died in 43 BC, so he was alive when the Lord was crucified, although he was in Rome. He said about crucifixion, it's the most cruel and horrifying death that man ever came up with. Tactitius, another Roman historian, said, it's a despicable death. Now, what's interesting to me is that the Romans did not invent crucifixion. It was the Persians that began to crucify people. And the reason being is because the earth to them was sacred. And so they wouldn't allow a, 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 a criminal or a murderer to defile it, see? In other words, they wouldn't, he had to be lifted up off the earth when he was executed, is, is what we see there. And what Rome did is this, they, they picked up on that. Uh, a Roman citizen was not allowed to be crucified, by the way. And in Italy, Roman providence, people were not allowed to be crucified. So it was outside the providence of Rome and only foreigners, if you would say, non-Romans that could be 
crucified. Did you see this? And one of the things that the Persians did is they allowed that body to hang on a cross or a, a stake until the vultures, okay, and the crows ate it down to the skeleton. Then the Persians would take it down and they'd bury it. And actually, they burned it. All right, so the earth wouldn't be defiled. Is that's that was their thinking. Now the Romans did not do that part of it. All right, when the person was dead, they they took them down, as we see this. So as we look at this, let's look at the steps involved in Jesus' death here. Yes. Yes. He was, yeah. That was part of that. That was part of prophecy, yeah. But even now, Rose just asked that uh, the two that were crucified with him weren't nailed; they were tied. And so, how did they die? Suffocation, okay, <laughs> and being out in the elements. Because some some people, according to history, they are on the cross for two weeks before they perished. All right, and and so it was a horrible thing, as as we look at it here and and see it. So let's let's look at this. So the first thing that happened in the case of our Lord and with most prisoners was this: that after the verdict of condemnation came down from whoever the judge was, all right, then they were scourged. All right, they were scourged. Uh, we're in Matthew twenty-seven. Turn back to verse twenty-six, please. I believe that's where it is. Okay, here uh, talking about Pilate in verse 26, then he released for them Barnabas, or Barabbas rather, Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Now you say, well, why? you know, Pilate had a hard time. He didn't know if the Lord was guilty or not. His wife told him, hey, don't condemn this man. You know, remember his wife had the dream and, and that sort of thing. So I wonder why he had him scourged. All right. Well, the scourging would bring death on quickly, more quickly, because when a man was scourged, as you see this, all right, and by the way, this is something that Jesus knew beforehand. He told his disciples that this would happen in Matthew chapter 20, verse 19. The victim was stripped down, tied to a pillar and into a bent position, or he was stretched on a rigid frame. Okay. And then what happened, the scourge was made of leather thongs studded with sharpened pellets and le of lead or iron or pieces of bone. And what would happen? All right, it would rip a man's back to pieces, not just the skin, but the muscle and the nerves and that sort of thing. So many men lost consciousness. Some ended up going raving mad when, when this occurred, okay? And it was done to break the spirit of a person, of a man. So he wouldn't fight back, is, is what it amounts to. And it, it break the spirit, and they would suffer seizures, is what happened. So this is some of what Jesus suffered. Of course, it would be the loss of blood, okay, dehydration, body would go into shock, that sort of thing. When I was uh, into the history of the British Navy, there was a... Uh, and I can't think of the name of the, of the mutiny, but it was a major mutiny. And when they found the three gentlemen, gentlemen the three sailors that started it, we we're, were talking about 15 or 16 uh, vessels of war, all right? What they did after the mutiny was settled, they brought the ships back uh, to Britain. And the three gentlemen there, I call them gentlemen, <laughs> they were put on a, in a long boat. And, and, and tied down, as we said, with their backs, you know, bare. And so they had the crew of the ship come and watch them be scourged. 30 lashes is what they got. Then they rowed to the next, uh, next ship. And the same thing happened. The crew of the ship had to come and watch it happen. Then they went to the next ship. 15 ships all together. Now the men were dead after the fifth ship but they kept doing it. Now, why would they do it? As a deterrent. Yeah, a, a deterrent. Uh, 
to keep mutiny out of the picture anymore, all right? So what are you saying? I'm saying it's a horrible thing to even to be scourged, all right? It was a, a, a horrible thing to be scourged. Now, when that happened, they were handed over to the soldiers that we just read here, and the soldiers made sport of them. Notice Matthew. Now, I'm going to stay in Matthew for the most part, so we don't have to turn to every one of the Gospels. But Matthew 27 again, and let's notice verse number 27, where it says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Now think about how this would feel if you're all cut up and bloody and, and they put this scarlet robe on him and twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand and kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. Well, what would that do? Striking him on the head. He had a crown of thorns. So with the reeds, it would drive the thorns in deeper to the head, see? I mean, this was a horrible thing, and we haven't even got out of the governor's place yet, all right, as, as we look at this. Mocked them. Then they proceeded to Calvary, as we call it. Now, you have to, have to picture this because I don't have a whiteboard here, but as they started going, what they do, there'd be a soldier in the front, of Jesus, one on either side, one in the back. And then behind the one in the back, there was a herald. And he would carry the signs of the crime, all right, that this criminal did. And what it said there in, in 2737, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. And remember, they put that up on the cross. And the Jews didn't want that put up there, but Pilate said, hey, it is what it is. I've written what I've written, right? So the prisoner then was taken the longest way through the city, through the busiest streets, to be a warning to everybody else in the city. They didn't do a beeline, in other words, you know, from Pilate's place, the governor's palace, to Calvary. No, they, they made a route through the city is what they did, all right? And there's another reason for this, because if there were witnesses uh, that were in favor of the criminal, in other words, they knew, hey, he really didn't do this, right? They could speak up while they were walking through the city. And if there was at least two witnesses, then everything would stop, and there'd be a retrial. But, of course, this didn't happen with our Lord Jesus Christ, okay, as, as we see this. So the criminal then was compelled to carry at least part of his cross to the place of execution. And, of course, we, you know, uh, Mr. Bollinger teaches that it was a stake. Peter calls it a tree. All right? And it could have been. But our Lord had to carry, carry it at least, all right, a, a, as far as he could a, a, as we see this. So... The trials, the examinations, the terrible torture of, of the scourging left Jesus so weak that he staggered and fell under the weight of the cross. And, of course, what happened there? Okay, uh, We do need now, come back to Mark with me, if you would, and chapter 15. All right, Mark 15. I think that's where I want to go. Mark 15. And let's notice verse 21. Now, 20 says at the end, and they led him out to be crucified, to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. All right? So this happened almost immediately. And I wonder why. How would you feel after being scourged? and beaten. Think you'd have any strength left in your legs? No. So this, this is what happened here, okay? Now, the way this worked, if a Roman soldier touched a Jew with the flat of his sword on the shoulder, then that Jewish man, or the man they touched, all right, was obligated to come and help the, the person that was accused and was going to crucifixion, 
All right, that, so that's what happened. Now, Simon here, Cyrene, he's from North Africa. So he was probably in town for what? The Passover, yeah. He's there for, for the festival, you see. Now, what, what's interesting to me, uh, let's go back to verse 21 here, okay? And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place of Golgotha. What's interesting about that word brought in the Greek, it means to bear or carry. And we're not talking about bearing or carrying the cross. They brought him, Jesus. Remember those two soldiers on either side? They dragged Jesus up to the Golgotha. That's what the whole idea here is. All right? I mean, he was so weak. And, and we need to understand that, that he couldn't carry that piece of wood, all right? So they got someone to do that, and the soldiers brought him physically up there, as you see this, okay? Uh, the word to bring, it's pharon in the Greek. It means to bear or carry, and that's what they did with, with our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Now, when we come to Golgotha, now this is interesting, and I'm going to go <clears throat> read you something here. All right, because they brought him to Golgotha, verse 22 in, in Mark 15, which means the place of the skull. All right, place of the skull. Now, let me read you a little note that I found. The Aramaic word Golgotha, so Golgotha is an Aramaic word, is in Latin Calvaria or Calvary, origin. You probably heard that name. I've used that. Okay. Historian, church father, we call him. An early church father recorded that Jesus was crucified at the place where, now listen to this. It's very interesting. Where Adam was buried and where his skull was found. David brought Goliath's head. Goliath and Golgotha are taken from the same root word and buried it outside of Jerusalem. Some believe this is where it got its name, Golgotha, the place of the skull. The cross, now hang on to this, the cross has to pierce the place of the skull for our minds to submit to the revelation of the cross. Do I need to read that again? The cross has to pierce the place of the skull for our minds to submit to the revelation of the cross. Why don't some people believe that Jesus Christ died, went to the cross and died for their sins? Doesn't get into their minds or hearts. So the, the idea here, the Jewish idea, all right, is that, and actually Origen was a Jewish uh, Egyptian, all right, that the idea is that the preaching of the cross has to go what? Has to go through the skull, <laughs> get to the mind. So that you can believe the revelation of what Christ went through for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? And so to get in. So why doesn't everybody believe it? Because it doesn't penetrate to the mind is what it's all about. All right? People shut it off, if you please, as, as you see this. And I, I thought that was interesting when I, when I found that, okay, as, as we look at this. So here we find also... Uh, that the custom was to give the victim a drink of medicated wine, all right? And we read that in, in the gospel accounts where they uh, attempted to give it to Jesus, but he wouldn't take it. And I wonder why he wouldn't take it. Because it was, it was dope. And he would no longer know what was going on, all right? But he came to suffer. Now, uh, keep your hand here in the gospel accounts. Come back to Proverbs, please. Okay. Come back to Proverbs. Here we are. And 31. Last chapter of Proverbs. All right. Be there in a second. Proverbs 31. And notice with me, please. Uh, Verse number six. Now, these are the words of King Lemuel. 
But he wrote, give strong drink to the one who is perishing and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. But the point being here, give drink to the one who is perishing and wine to him, those in bitter distress. Now, in the, uh, I don't remember exactly where I found this, but I think it's in the Jewish social life in the time of Jesus Christ. I have five volumes of that. And they mention in there that in Palestine, all right, and other cities would happen wherever the Romans were, where they did crucify people, that the Roman soldiers paid a lady, a woman, to make wine, strong wine, for them, for the soldiers, as they executed someone of the cross. Now, why would that be, I wonder? It was so horrible that it would stick in your mind and hearts, and they didn't want to, they didn't want, as Rose just said, they wouldn't want to remember these things. See what I mean? It is, is what happened. So the Lord wouldn't take it. Now what they did towards the end, they put a mouthful of vinegar to, to his lips, all right, before he gave up the ghost of his father, all right? So these things to me are very interesting as, as you look at them, okay? Jesus refused to drink. And I have the note here, he would meet death at its bitterest and with all his senses at their keenest. Uh, come back to Mark with me, please, and 15. And let's notice verse 23. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. All right? And they crucified him. So while he was laying on the ground with the nails in his hands, it appears this is when they offered it to him. But he wouldn't take it. Okay? He wouldn't take it at all. Now, I do have a note here that most of the crosses... And you don't see this too much in the in the pictures of our Lord hanging on a cross. Had a small saddle on it where they could almost sit for just a little bit, not totally, but it, it would come out just a few inches to give give some relief. Okay, and uh, the reason for that is so that the weight. Now you know people say that the nails went through the wrists. I don't know if that's true or not. All right. Uh, it says through the hands, but where would it grab onto it be between the bones? But at any rate, the saddle was put there so the nails wouldn't rip the hands out, okay? And, and, and the man would fall as, as we see this, okay? So uh, the nails driven then through the hands, most victims cursed and swore and shrieked, shrieked <laughs> and spit at their executioners. But Jesus, come over to Luke chapter 23. Okay. Luke 23. Luke 23. Notice, please, verse 34. Here's what Jesus did instead of cursing and swearing and shrieking at people. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So what's that tell you? These soldiers were ignorant of what was happening. They had no idea on why, why this was going on, okay? So then what happened is this, in a moment of searing agony, the cross would be lifted and dropped into the hole, okay? And his whole body would shift, you know? The whole body would shift, it wasn't good. So what did they do next up here? Okay, in verse 34, as, as we look at, and they cast lots to divide his garments. I don't know why they would want his garments. They'd be blood filled and soaked, all right, but they did. So the common, okay, uh, set of clothes would be a belt, sandals, a girdle, a turban, a tunic, and a great robe, all right? And you look at the great robe, and again, this is something that was a custom in Israel. The robe was probably, I say probably, woven by his mother, the Lord. And that's what he used, 
all right, after he, he uh, left home. And most likely it was made by his mother, okay, as you see this. And, and there's a reference, and I'm not going to turn there, but Exodus 22, 26, that if you want to take a look at that. So when Jesus is on the cross then, the cross stood seven to nine feet above the ground, all right, seven to nine feet. So uh, I don't know if that means that his head was at seven foot or nine foot or his feet were at seven foot or nine foot. It'd be very difficult for him to put a body up there that weighed 140, 50 pounds, okay, that, that high up. But at any rate, that's where he was. And it's, as he watches the soldiers cast lots for him, okay, which was the last gift to him, I have John 19, 26. Let's go over there. Okay, John 19, 26. 19, 26 <clears throat> says, When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved, disciple whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. And so, of course, we believe that is, is John. But what we find then is this, that the venom of Jesus' enemies didn't stop at his trial. Come on back to Matthew with me, if you would, in 27 again. Matthew chapter 27. So in 27, let's pick it up in verse 39. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. Now, I find it interesting here. Let me read one verse. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. Now, why would these chief priests and scribes and elders even be there? You ever think of that? When, when, a, when a man is executed today, or even a woman, you know, they're not public. You'll, you'll have a few witnesses there, and maybe a relative or two, but it's not open to the public for this. But Jesus was, it was open to the public. So these guys had venom to the end, nth degree here, all right, of what's going on with our Lord Jesus Christ. They gloated over a man whom they thought they were eliminating forever. But behold, what happens after the Lord raises from the dead? And the apostles begin their ministry in Acts chapter number 2 and 3 and onward and onward. Man, they're flooded over and over with what the man Jesus Christ had taught them. Okay? Then, of course, you had the two thieves that were crucified with them. Okay? Matthew 27, again, in verse number 38. The two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left. And that's, a, that's a, a lesson in itself because at the beginning, they both mocked him. But at the end, one of them asks for forgiveness, you know, as you look at this. So from 9 a.m. to noon, this is what happened. Then from noon to 3, darkness came over the land. And we slide down to verse 26. 46, please. Down to verse 46. It says this, And about the ninth hour, it's about three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay? Why have you forsaken me? Of course, our brother Bill Petrie was here and did a message on this. And what was his idea about it? Does anybody remember? On the cross, yeah, and and that's what Bill, you know, the idea would be like the sacrifices at the temple were put on an altar and offered in love, 
And that's how Jesus should have been, but he, but he wasn't. Why have you forsaken me? Now, when you go to uh, Paul's epistles, 2 Corinthians, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Okay, so he never left his son as, as we see this. Okay, but then as you, as, as you move on down, notice verse 48. Uh, let's see. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. Now, this would be the same drink from the beginning. Okay, from the beginning. And he finally, you know, he just wet it and, and, and to see what would happen there. Okay, so at the end, we have to go to John 19 for this, please. John chapter 19, if you would. John 19. And all right, that's too far, Dan. John 19. And let's notice the verse number 30. As soon as I get to 19, here we are. When Jesus had received the sour wine, so he took it. He said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. All right. It is finished, he said. So he says, in, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Okay? Now, let me say this to you. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. That's a Jewish prayer that children prayed before they went to bed. They put themselves in the hands of their father, feeling secure that they could sleep because dad was there to protect them. All right. So that's what Jesus said. Now, when I come down to verse 31 here in John 19, please. Since it was a day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the others who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, and they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. And he who saw it bore witness. This testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. So in all his agony that we see with our Lord Jesus Christ, mercy is found. Uh, William Barclay in his Colossians commentary says, says this, and I'm going to read this to you. The medium of reconciliation was the blood of the cross. It was necessary. The driving force behind reconciliation was the death of Jesus Christ. What does Paul mean? He means exactly what, the Ro what is said in Romans 8.32, which says, He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for us all, Will he not with him also give us everything else? Praise the Lord. In the death of Jesus, God is saying to us, I love you like that. I love you enough to see my son suffer and die for you. The cross is the proof that there are no lengths to which the love of God will refuse to go in order to win human hearts. And to love like a love like that demands an answering love. If the cross will not waken love in our hearts, nothing will. You go back to the thought that the Jews had about the, <laughs> the cross going through the skull to the mind. So people would believe. All right. Now, I want to ask you this. We, ha we have a few minutes here. And I want you to think about this for a minute. What is the result of this? 
What are the results of the cross work of Jesus Christ three days later, his resurrection? Yeah, can you talk to me? You can talk to me. I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. For what purpose? How about redemption? All right. How about justification? How about righteousness? How about us being the sons of God? How about us receiving the spirit of God and the very nature of Christ in our hearts? All this, and we could go, I could go on and on and on here. When you read the epistles and you begin to read, hey, I'm in Christ. Why? Because he went to the cross. I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Why? Because he went to the cross. You follow me here? All this takes place because of the cross. And so when you're reading the epistles and you read the blessings that we have, we have because Jesus was willing to fulfill the will of the Father. And Peter talks about that in Acts 2 and 3. The predetermined counsel of God the Father is why Jesus ended up on the cross. See? He, Paul even writes, hey, these, these folks are ignorant. If they knew who Christ really was, they would never crucify him. Y'all remember that? Why are you the temple of, of God? Because of the cross. You are the temple of God. That's what Peter or, uh, Paul tells us, does he not? We're being gathered together as a habitation for God. Hebrews chapter number, or Ephesians chapter number two. Why? Because of the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ and his ultimate resurrection. All right? So when we read these things and we begin to think about these things, you can never take them for granted. Never. Because when we look at this, man, it was through the suffering of the Son of God, who was the Word. And the Word was with God. It says the Word was God, the deity there. And the Word became flesh, John 1. And as we look at these things, I would implore you to think about them. And you know what it does to your Bible reading? It gives it purpose. It shows you how much God loves you. All right? He gave, he gave, he gave. All right. And, and it's, it's a wonderment to me that this happens. Uh, Carl and Chuck and I had opportunity yesterday afternoon out in Albion to talk to numerous people about this sort of thing, you know, and, and the, the one gentleman, I can't even think of his, his name. He was all dressed up in camouflage stuff. Who was that Chuck? You remember? And he, he was there almost the whole time we were there eating hamburgers and hot dogs. Having a, having a good time, but when, when he talk, I talked to him about the cross, and he just, he didn't know where to go with it, you know, and that's how people are. It has to get into their minds and hearts so they can believe, see, but it all started with whom? Our Lord Jesus, that trial, and as we've been talking about on Wednesday nights, more than the trial, okay, how the Jews were trying to trap him during his whole ministry, as, as we saw that. But he said, hey, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. And what was he talking about? He was talking about his body, and that's what he did. That's a temple, see? And it all comes about because of his crucifixion. So, never take it for granted, is what I'm saying. New thing, every time you read the epistles, you read something good, it's because our Lord gave his life for us.